No, that's excellent. Let me go back to your first question, Steve, in terms of how the advice changes. So in our clinical practice, you know, when patients first come to us, it's incredibly important that we focus on some of the basics. You got to make sure that you understand where uremic toxins are going to come from, and they come from your gut microbiome. So what you eat is going to translate into the type of toxins you produce. You're constantly doing this, and a lot of the stuff that you create, whether it's autoimmune conditions or it's inflammation or it's other things such as uremic toxins affecting different aspects of your body, is starting from the food you eat and how it interacts. And this is why when people are on a predominantly meat diet, they have a lot more inflammation that's going on inside their bodies. And as they switch over, it takes time. How much time? On the order of months going on. So when you first meet a patient, even if let's say there's somebody who's got a GFR above 60 and they don't have any protein in the urine, which by definition means they don't have kidney disease, but what's their blood pressure? Because let's say your blood pressure is 130 over 80. You may say, well, you know what? That's a great blood pressure. But what does that mean in terms of the blood pressure that's going inside your kidneys? We call it intraglomerular hypertension. So in other words, we can have patients whose blood pressure systemically is okay, but they still have higher blood pressures. What are telltale signs? If you have extra weight, especially if you have extra weight around your trunk area, that's creating pressure, mechanical pressure directly on the kidneys. That's an opportunity to work directly on the patient to make sure they realize what is that impact going on. So we're very aggressive in terms of making sure the blood pressures are excellent. Food is an excellent way to do that, especially as you go towards whole foods. When you look at things like salt, salt is critical. People eat so much sodium upwards to about five grams of sodium every single day without even realizing it. One fast food meal, you're getting 1500 milligrams without even blinking easily. So when we talk about getting the sodium content down, it's incredibly important no matter where you are. And as your kidney disease progresses, we double down even more on these recommendations. Earlier on, the higher your potassium intake, the lower your blood pressure ends up going. We have really good data to support this. How do you get more potassium? You eat more fruits and vegetables going on. So as you're going through that spectrum, what we want to focus on is what's the quality of your food? How's that going? Now, if you get to the point where your potassium clearance is not good, we'll make the adjustment. But up until that point, we're not going to tell you to start restricting just because the book says, you can't have X, Y, and Z. That's a mistake going on. Phosphorus, we start to talk about phosphorus when you don't have kidney disease, when you have very early kidney disease, and even if your phosphorus is normal. Why? Because the number one reason that people die with kidney disease is not because of kidney disease. They die because of their heart. And we know that when we do x-rays on these folks or we do any kind of scans, they light up like a Christmas tree. There are so many vascular calcifications that are happening. And phosphorus, especially inorganic phosphorus, is such a simple thing. Get rid of the processed foods. And as you start to get rid of the worst kinds of phosphorus out of your diet, you're setting themselves up for success going on. So there are all of these things that start the first time you meet them and they go down. And this is why you got to have a knowledgeable dietitian on your team because you don't want to wait until they're CKD stage five, and now they're going to go on dialysis, and now they should go see a dietitian for the first time. This is not the time. You should have done that when they first came and saw you to start this whole journey. You know, fiber is so important because fiber is your prebiotic going on. It's going to feed the healthy bacteria. So if you want to reduce uremic toxins from going into your gut, you want to get more fiber in your diet. How much do you want to get? 40 grams a day. You know, when, when folks who know me, I always joke about folks who are so obsessed with the paleo diet. And I always tell people, I love the paleo diet, just not the one that gets printed in the books. If you look at the studies, on average, our ancestors were getting close to 100 grams of fiber a day, 100. That's the original paleo diet. It wasn't that they were so good at hunting with their saber tooth claws that they used to be able to get animals and all this stuff. We weren't that good at that. The first civilizations came around water. Why? Because they needed water to live. And two was the kind of hunting they were doing was they were getting fish. 
that's about the extent of the hunting. But the majority of the foods they were getting was a ton of fiber, and they had the GI tracts to be able to tolerate it. So we want lots and lots of fiber early on and as they progress. Even when they get on dialysis, we want more fiber because it reduces the production of uremic toxins. We can't even measure all the uremic toxins. We measure things like precresyl sulfate and doxyl sulfate. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many toxins that are being produced. So at the top, we start. And then as it goes down, we double down on the strength of that advice. And the only flips that happen is certain things like potassium to the point where the clearance goes down. Um, I've taken, when I've listened to speakers speak before, I've taken it very seriously when they said not to eat animal products and not to eat sugar. But I've taken salt kind of light, like, well, salt in my flax crackers doesn't count and salt in the you know whole foods guacamole doesn't count and it's in my olives. So can you, in terms of chronic kidney disease, can you tell, talk to us about salt? Yeah, it's very simple. I'll give you a very simple example. How would you like to make your medications for kidney disease twice as effective? Cut down salt. If you have protein in the urine and I give you an ACE inhibitor, if I give you an ACE inhibitor and then you eat the typical standard American diet or the SAD diet, you're going to spill X amount of protein, it'll go down. But if you do the same ACE inhibitor, ARBs, whatever, and you cut down your salt, you'll see that the studies show you can improve that number by 50% more. How crazy is that? How crazy is it that the diet portion will make the medicine more effective? So once again, this is not diet or medication. This is, I just want to figure out what is the best for you and give you the best opportunity. And what's the number one predictor of how fast your kidney disease is going to go down is the amount of protein you spill in the urine. So we need to fix the protein in the urine. That's one of the biggest things we're after. And how cool is that? That a simple thing like cutting back salt can actually do that. And salt is in every type of food. You know, it's a funny thing. People are like, but don't you need salt to survive? Of course you do. But aside from my few patients where, who have like SIADH, where I actually need to give them salt tabs, which is like one out of like 300 patients, every patient that I see, if they were to say, I'm going to take zero salt in my diet, if they were to tell me that, they would still get plenty of salt in their diet. They would never be in a situation in America where they would be worried about not having enough salt in their diet. Um, and if I juice celery, is there any chance I could get too much salt from that or that, that that's okay because it's from a celery? Jen, do you want to, since this is uh, your, so first of all, what, what, I, don't know, I, I don't know what's up with people and juicing. You know, I, I got to tell you, like this whole juicing thing, it just, it bugs me, right? So you let nature spend millions of years trying to craft the perfect food for you. And then you just ruin it all. You leave all the fiber of the celery behind. And all you get is basically water. No, you're not going to get salt overdose with it. But what you are going to get is essentially nothing, right? Eat the celery. The celery is nature intended you to eat the celery, eat the celery. You know, it's funny, I was um, busy eating carrots. I love carrots because they're great. But, you know, my kids are always like, we want carrot juice. I'm like, how'd you get this? How'd you get into this idea? Now, I don't force them to go my way. But I can tell you this whole juicing concept is the worst idea ever. In fact, here's something that most people don't understand. You know, my other hat is obesity medicine. The number one way for people to gain weight is through taking liquid calories. When we do bariatric surgery, we literally take their stomach, we take this large stomach, we turn it into this little tiny stomach, which is sleeve, or we do a bypass where we bypass a portion of their small intestine. So we call that a ruin y gastric bypass. Do you know how people overcome both of those surgeries? They drink their calories instead of chew their calories. So this concept of juicing, I have still have no idea how I can come up with any redeeming qualities for it. 
If anyone yeah, would- and going back to sodium, you know, I mean, I think a lot of times people miss the forest for the trees. Like people are not getting too much salt from celery juice across the board. It's just not happening. They're getting too much salt from eating out, um, <clears throat> from eating things like processed packaged foods and um, canned foods. So really they need to become a master at reading labels, um, which dietitians can help you with. Um, so <clears throat> if you're looking at a label, just quick tips, always look at the serving size. Because it may say, you know, only 400 milligrams of sodium per serving, and there's four servings in there. So that's a lot of sodium. Also, um, one rule of thumb is just try to keep it at 200 milligrams of, or less per serving. If you're reading a label, that's a good rule of thumb. If you're eating out, a whole lot of times the salt is in either the, the dressing, like the salad dressing, or the sauce. Ask for those on the side. Um, you can even, if you're eating at a, like a restaurant, you can ask them to make your food with less salt. Now at fast food, there's a problem with that because a lot of that food comes almost like pre-prepared in a sense, fast food is all, but just heating it up. They cannot change the, uh, how much salt is in there. It's what's in there is in there. So another good reason we ought to not be eating fast food, except for on a very rare, rare basis, if at all. But um, if you're eating out at a restaurant, you do have some control. Take that control. Ask your food, to, ask for them to make your food with less salt. Ask to have seasoning, I mean, sauces and salad dressings on the side. But most importantly, cook at home. So one thing that I run into is people say, I hear this all the time, I don't cook. Okay, we got to change that. So that's why in my second book, I made every recipe five ingredients or less. Anybody can do that, okay? Okay. Um, People, I think a lot of times nowadays, people don't cook because all the recipes online have 30 different ingredients. You can't pronounce half of them. You don't know where to get them. And they tell a big story before the recipe. And you have to click this button that says jump to recipe. And people are like, forget it, forget it. So <clears throat> keep things simple when you cook and you'll be, and it'll be much more enjoyable. Anybody can follow instructions, especially if they're simple instructions. That's all a recipe is, is just instructions. Um, and then why not? You know, it's a great way to spend your time, especially as a family, bringing families back around the table. What a great way to spend your time cooking for your family and spending time together. Um, what would that do for us in America? I think it would do a lot. So, and I think if you really like take a time inventory of your day, you have time to cook. You just have to stop wasting time, say, on the phone or other things you may be doing, playing a game. Um, take a little bit of that time and cook for your family. Um, another thing would be like meal planning, like plan ahead on the weekends. Like, what are we going to have next week? And start small. Let's say I'm going to cook two nights. I'm going to cook two nights a week. And start there. Plan out, get the groceries that you need, have everything there so there's no excuses. And then just enjoy that. Enjoy that time of preparing food. Um, that can be another thing that's just good for your family, good for your soul and good for your health too.